Hey my friends, how are you today? My name is Misty Sims and if you found me, you found my little corner of the internet that I like to call Beyond Reasonable Doubt where we talk about all things, all things, yeah, all, th all things. I don't know why I'm like this. <laughs> all things, true crime, culty, and a little bit creepy. If you are new here, thank you so much for clicking that link. I do hope that you will hit that subscribe button and hang out with me long term so we can talk about more true crime all the time. And if you're not new here and you're a returning subscriber, thank you so much for coming back and you already know I appreciate you and love you more than cupcakes with sprinkles. Um, if you guys would take a quick second to like, subscribe, comment, share, rate it if you're over on Spotify as a podcast just do all those things it really helps the channel out helps me get out more true crime all this time to you guys keeps everything free and and we're loving free over here because things are crazy right now everything's expensive but uh we're not over here on beyond reasonable doubt so um how are you guys doing if you're on YouTube got a little background change um I don't love it because I don't know like it's not real like I wanted it to be like drapey and creepy and all this stuff and it's drapey but it's I don't I don't think it's creepy but it's almost Halloween month uh around here I love all things October I love all things fall I love all things Halloween so I wanted to get ready a little bit early even though it's not quite October 1st yet. Um, but yeah, so we're gonna, we'll straighten this up a little bit, but uh, we got some new lighting. I'm very excited about that. And it is cold today, so we're breaking out the hoodie. I don't know if you can see it. Um, this uh, It's an Undertaker hoodie, so appropriate for Halloween and, and October. Uh, you guys know I love WWE. I love October. I love The Undertaker. Just had to get it. Um, if you're looking for a sweatshirt like this um, and you're a big fan, I think this was on Nine Line Apparel. Um, yeah, there you go. So, not sponsored anyway, just a really cool sweatshirt. So, anyway, hope you guys are having a great week. I hope you guys are ready for fall. It's almost pumpkin patch time around here. I actually went and got pumpkins already. So, shout out to the little farm up here who gave this, or, well, they didn't give them to me, but they had them and they have great prices. So, um, amazing got my little friend here joining me um, which is is appropriate because today's case is going to be a long one um, you're gonna need to grab your comfy socks a blanket uh, some of y'all listen while you're cleaning grab your cleaning products a snack whatever you need um, because this one is gonna take you through all the emotions possible and there's I don't think there's not one you're gonna feel um, maybe not happy, <laughs> maybe that one, um, happy that it's over, uh, <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's, it's a case that's hit global headlines, it, it's been going on for a while as far as the, what should have been the investigation all along, um, the arrests that happened, I believe in 2018, 2019, and 2020, and then ultimately it led to a 10-month trial, um, it it was a long trial you you just I think a lot of people like myself included I didn't really read into the trial a lot because when you when you hear the story and you hear the case and then you hear the victims you don't want to believe it it's just it's super sinister it's terrible the victims are innocent babies in a, in a NICU so you're just I don't know it takes you to a place you just don't want to go to right like these crimes are all deep and they're all dark and and it's it's unfortunate but this was this is this hits different that hits a lot different and I think it's even more terrifying because the victimizer who has now been brought to justice like I, when you when you look at their face you you don't see you, you don't see that of a killer I, I, or I, I do now, but I, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have looked at this individual as, as anything more than someone who was, you know, probably doing a job of trying to help, as it seemed, and then find out that the motive all along was dark and, and disgusting and all the things. I, I, I don't, there's not even words. Uh, so trigger warning, you may lose some sleep over this. Um, the victims are babies. 
Um, it's going to have you second guessing everybody you put your trust in, uh, especially in the medical profession, because we think they're there to help. And this this wretched person definitely was not. So in case you didn't read the title of the video that you clicked on, I am pretty sure by now you know we're going to be talking about none other than Nurse Ratchet herself, Lucy Letby. Um, this is going to be deep. So it's a big deep dive. It's going to be disturbing. It's dark. If you need to protect yourself and click out of this video, I totally understand. And I will see you hopefully in another one. Um, as always, let's be kind in the comments. Uh, th this one's hard to be kind over, but it is. It, people are torn over this. Um, the facts present themselves in a certain way, but I also uh, can understand due to the... the um, the cover-ups that went on, why people might believe that Lucy could potentially be a scapegoat uh, for this hospital because they have they have also done some things that probably aren't on the up and up, so it does make you question that. Um, I before we even get into it, I, I agree with the jury. I, I think she I think the right decision was made. Um, but some people don't. And if you have, you know, evidence and, and you or you're in the Reddit communities and things like that that don't believe that she's guilty, by all means, um, feel free to comment and, and explain why I, I like to hear those other sides just let's do it respectfully and kindly because this one is very emotionally charged and we we don't want to cause any other hurt coming out of it so all that said all that aside let's dive into the dark case of lucy letby Lucy Letby was a trusted nurse who was taking care of NICU babies, probably one of the most important and toughest jobs in the entire world. But Lucy was doing it, doing it, and seemingly everything was normal, and things were going just as you would expect. Um, you know, no one ever expected it to take the dark turn that it took. Um, so, so who, who was Lucy Letby? Who, who was this person who has become a household name now that, um, quite frankly, you know, most people globally don't know the names of, of a NICU nurse in the UK. So how did we come to, to know who this young lady was? So let's start at the beginning. Lucy Letby was born on January 4th of 1990, and she was born in Hereford, England, and I'm probably butchering that name, um, but that's how I've always heard it how it said Hereford. Um, I think some people say Hereford, but it's a beautiful place in the English countryside, but where I was familiar with the name of it from were the Hereford cows, because that's cattle that is uh, very predominantly used in food production in the world. And you guys know that, you know, I, I come from a, a more rural area in Tennessee, so I'm, I am familiar. It's not like I'm a cattle farmer, couldn't milk a cow if I had to, definitely couldn't make, you know, slaughter one for meat or whatever but I at least you know at least knew what that was <laughs> but she, you know it's a beautiful picturesque town that she's from they are famous for these cattle um but very very pretty place very small town quaint great place to raise family her father um he was a a, a, a very um prominent man in the community he was a furniture retailer um prior to his retirement and then her mother Susan was an accounts clerk and seemingly everything in Lucy's early life was very typical you know she had doting parents um, they loved her very very much they saw you know great goals for Lucy in the future because Lucy was hardworking and she was she was looking forward to attending university after high school graduation um, which she did and she was going to pursue nursing and you know although her friends I think would you know described her as very kind-hearted um they also said she was a little bit awkward a little bit geeky but she was very very uh determined to pursue her dream as a nurse and she was working very hard at it and they all agreed you know that this was you know something that she was just you know driven to do and wanted to do and and, and was working very hard towards that goal and she attributed this just want and need to be a nurse to her difficult birth um, I didn't get a lot of details on this, but apparently it was quite traumatic. And 
she credits the nurses who were on staff that day for her entire reason for being here and being alive. So she wanted to, you know, go forward and, and do things like that for others. And I think that's, you know, um, a great goal and a great reason behind it. It's a great why statement. Um, obviously, it takes a little bit more sinister of a turn, but, you know, started off in a great place, right? Lucy started off seemingly with her heart in the right place. Um, while she was studying to be a nurse, she did do some student training at Liverpool Women's Hospital, and then she also worked at Countess of Chester Ho- Chester Hospital. I'll get that out in a second. Um, and and this would go on to be the hospital that she ended up working at after she graduated university. Um, she's described as having a, a great relationship with her parents. Um, you know, they were so, so proud of her because she was one of the first members of the family to go on and graduate from college. You know, her future was very, very bright and they were, you know, ecstatic that she accepted this job at Countess of Chester hospital after her graduation, after what a great experience she had while she was there as a student. Um, so she starts working there in the fall of 2011 and, I mean, she was just described as being a great nurse. She took the job extremely seriously, which I think you, you know, in that line of work, you you should. And and she was so serious about it, in fact, that like several papers uh, picked up some articles about her. And, you know, they were interviewing her and, and supporting the hospital and trying to raise, I believe it was three million pounds um, in support of the neonatal unit to build a new unit. So, you know, they're, they're trying to raise this money and they're picking her as the poster child of the neonatal new unit to write about. Like, that's how strongly the community even felt about her. So, you know, she's, she's doing all these amazing things. Um, she has a, a social life too that sounds quite um, amazing, actually. I mean, she was going off on vacations to Ibiza. Um, you know, she, she enjoyed, you know, having drinks with her friends. Uh, I think the two drinks that they quoted in particular were Prosecco and uh, vodka, I believe, but um, the Prosecco especially. And, and we have seen several pictures of her with like, you know, her little, little cute champagne glass and things like that. So she's, she's living a, a fun life with her friends. She's taking salsa dancing classes in her spare time. So, you know, she, she's filling up her calendar she, she's just the typical young lady with a career, with her friends. She's got focus. I mean, everything just seems to be going right for Lucy and, and her living the, the dream uh, of, a, of a young English girl in you know, her early 20s. So let's fast forward to 2015. And that is where things start to go sideways a little bit. Now, it'll be a little while before others notice it, but um, as they relived all these events through her trial, which has already taken place, if, if you've been keeping up with the news, this is where we start to see the red flags. I don't have one, but I, mean, I need to get one because this is where we're going to start waving them. So she's working in the neonatal unit at the um, Countess of Chester Hospital, and these babies are in critical need of 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 care you know they they're either born prematurely they could be born with some type of illness they could be born with some type of disability you know many many reasons why you might find yourself um it, with a NICU baby and the 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 deaths of you know all the other uh hospitals in the area for the infant mortality rate right, in the NICU and Countess of Chester, they aligned at this point. You know, it, you might, yeah, you know, one might have five, one might have six, but they're close, right? You know, there's not any deltas that anybody is going to be looking at as a little suspicious. But give Lucy a minute because she's going to take care of that for us. She's going to change that. Um, you know, she just began unleashing her demons on these babies for whatever reason. And and she's she's denied any of this up to this point. So I want to be very clear that I do say that. She has not said that she committed any of these acts, uh, regardless of the outcome of her trial. But um, for what we know now, it is to believe that, that she did do this. And we just don't know the why. Um, but when she started working in the neonatal unit at this hospital in 2015, there was a major uptick in the deaths 
of these babies and it, it was pretty dramatic um you know i mean a neonatal unit is going to experience its its fair share of loss already but this was a drastic incline all at, all at once so and much more than what you would think that the historical metrics would have predicted right so <sighs> Some of these babies, they, they seem like they're getting better. You know, they'll have some issues. They'll seemingly be getting better, and then just they just collapse. It's very sudden. It's very scary. Um, the situation, it, it's, it's ominous. It's perplexing. The doctors don't know what's going on. Families don't know what's going on, you know. Uh, but all these babies are starting to um, kind of have similar symptoms as far as, you know, they may be doing fine, and then they crash. A few you will see have similar um outward symptoms like a rash and things like that but then no matter what there's always one thing in common and that is either lucy is in charge of their care or she was very close by prior to the collapse and, and another key point uh, of interest is that typically um a lot of these babies are siblings uh, they may be uh, uh, twins or part of a triplet pair but very often um, we are going to see that they are related. So, um, you know, she definitely doesn't single out just one. She, she keeps spreading it around to, to several. Um, so doctors are starting to become, you know, they, they, they become disturbed with, the, with this sudden increase in infant deaths. Who wouldn't, right? Um, and they, they notice that Lucy is the one that's in question. And they start to take a deeper look and they begin to believe that she is using things such as air injections to end their lives. And in the neonatal unit, as I understood it from the test, the testimonies that I read, they believe that these air injections were done. Um, it's a little harder to detect, I think, um, without knowing what you're looking for and things like that. And, you know, sometimes I, would imagine my completely unprofessional unmedical trained opinion as a lady on the internet with a camera is that you know you already have compromised you know medically compromised children in these in the neonatal unit i wonder if she thought they would even look close enough to figure this out of course when you're killing them left right and sideways the way she was it's gonna raise some eyebrows so yeah, I mean, thank God, right? You know, she made it up to, like, they, they gave these infants um, uh, letters to ID, ID them, and she made it all the way up to Q. So, I mean, she was she was running on down the course there pretty quickly. But um, once these doctors started to suspect things, and, and, and let, me, let me be very, very clear, it took way too long for this investigation to have to go on. For meetings to happen and things to go down the way that they did but she was finally arrested thankfully um and multiple times actually so she was arrested first in july of 2018 then june of 2019 and then finally it stuck in 2020 and she was charged with the murder of seven babies and then the attempted murder of 10 more so you know of course you know, she pleads not guilty because that's what she's gonna do um, and she, you know, she had, she had an explanation for all of them, right? Like, of course, cause like every serial killer does like, you know, no, no, nobody's ever been anywhere and doing anything. Right. Um, but the, like I said, the babies were given letters. Um, their families wanted them to remain anonymous. They wanted to protect them, um, and protect their stories. Uh, cause they were, you know, nobody, nobody wants this much attention at all, especially after they've just grieved the loss of an infant. Um, but you're going to hear me refer to the babies as babies A through Q. And then a lot of the doctors and the staff wanted to remain anonymous. So I'm not going to call most uh, any of them other than Lucy by name. So um, you can look a few of them who gave testimony up on the internet. But outside of that, it will just be straight the doctor, the nurse, that type of thing. So, um, and, and I don't blame him for wanting to be anonymous at this point because I wouldn't want to be associated with this lady to save my life. Like, no, she's, I just want to erase everything from her. So anyway, Lucy was finally arrested, finally stuck in 2020, and we get to her trial in August of 2022. So it, it took a while, um, and, and it lasted about 10 months. It was a long trial. This jury had to be war slap out. Um, but the prosecution went in and they, they went in with their case and they went in pretty hard uh, on Lucy, who was 29 when her trial began. Um, 
And so I'm going to lay out for you a very similar type of chronological events the way they la they laid it out. Now it's summarized. It's it's you know condensed down. This video is already going to be super duper long, um, but ten months of a trial. We're you know we're not going to cover every single statement but i do want to take you through what these poor little babies went through because it is it's it's tough um it's tough uh, it's gonna be a tough one to get through but we're gonna get there because i think their story it deserves to be told right and we deserve to know just just what what she did here so let's start out in chronological order and we're going to start with baby a so baby a was a little boy uh he was one of two uh, sibling pair of twins and he was born just a minute apart from his brother who was um born via they were both born via c-section so you know these little little teeny tiny th babies were placed in the NICU because they were at 31 weeks um, gestation so they were a little premature but you know 31 weeks definitely something that is viable right uh, so baby A is do he's doing okay you know a day after being born you know he he's breathing on his own he doesn't need any extra oxygen I mean he's been drinking a little bit of breast milk you know to, to sustain him so I mean you know he's he's doing things that you would expect a baby to do that's progressing towards you know um, thriving and things like that so you know great and then here comes Lucy to take her shift at 730 so she's gonna take over from the day nurse um, and by 826 so she took her shift at 7.30 at night, 8.26 at night. So not even quite an hour and a half. She's already calling a doctor and she's like, you need to come in here. Something's not right. He's got a very odd discoloration to his skin and he's not responsive. So within an hour and 26 minutes, we have gone from a baby who has done well all day to one who is not responsive. And despite you know life-saving efforts, actually ends up passing away in less than an hour and a half from when she took her shift so strange right but no one's gonna notice right now because this is our first instance um i thought one of the saddest parts about this whole thing too was that baby a was placed on a hot cot and if you don't know what a hot cot is a hot cot is what they will place infants on when something unfortunate does happen because it it regulates um, it, it can be used in the NICU to just regulate body temperature, but in the event that an unfortunate event happens, it can also be used to sustain body temperature while the the families are saying their goodbyes. So they don't have to experience holding an ice cold infant, and that just it gutted me. Um, I'm thankful for that for families because um, I think that would just make it ten times you know worse than it already is. Um, I'm already getting emotional just thinking about it, but, but anyway, so, you know, this poor little thing is on this hot cot. The family is in here saying goodbye. Lucy comes in. She, she actually places baby A in the mother's arms so that, you know, she can hold him for the last time. And after her shift is over, she starts looking the mom up on Facebook and, and like, it, you know, maybe if this had just happened the one time, I'd be like, okay, well, maybe she was just checking on them, making sure that they were doing okay. Um, um, but, you know, it weird still, right? And, and after her arrest, she this digital footprint that we've talked about so many times in so many other cases, you know, the police look into it and they see this and they ask her about it, confront her with it. And she's like, you know, admits that she looked her up, but said she didn't know why. She doesn't remember why she looked her up. I mean, I'm sure we can figure it out as we go along, but, um, you know, she would, she'd go on to talk about how, you know, she was the one who on duty administered baby A some fluids as prescribed, but that there must have been something wrong with the fluids. And, you know, she asked that the bag be checked out uh, or said that she had asked for the bag to be checked out. So I guess something didn't look right. And none of this was able to be um, corroborated at all. So we, you know, we're going on Lucy's word here, which is as put together as my backdrop right now. So not, not anything we need to be taking seriously. Um, medical experts, <coughs> excuse me, medical experts would testify that 
they believe baby A actually died from an air injection into his bloodstream, which would be responsible for a sudden and quick collapse like this. And it also would cause the discoloration that were, was found on the skin because doctors actually described it as like a shade of blue with some pink overlaid it. And that is distinctive of this air being injected into the skin, apparently. And in a postmortem x-ray, they actually found gas, a line of gas in front of the spine. And pediatric radiologists, um, they described this as odd. And they said that there was a, um, when asked, you know, had you ever seen this before? Or, or do, have you ever seen this, uh, you know, before or again? And they said, actually, yes, it was in the investigation with another baby in Lucy's care and in this case. So, you know, tying all this together kind of looks like we might be responsible. But um, the, something else that just struck me really odd so, you know, as of right now, we know Lucy was responsible for, or has been found guilty, of spoiler alert, of being responsible for this baby's death. And she, while the baby was crashing, while the vials are crashing, you know, she looks at the parents and asks them if they are religious and would they like to say a prayer. And I'm like, girl, you better go on now. Because, I mean, you're sitting there and you're saying this. I'm not saying I'm not religious because we, you know, I've been very open that I am. But you know you're responsible for this. You know you're the one that's doing this. Like, you are watching your handiwork, you know, come together. And you ask them if they want to say a prayer. You are lucky they did not pray for you because they were about to whoop your tail off that hospital. But anyway. So, baby A passes away. After baby A dies, Lucy starts just sending this slew of text messages to her colleagues talking about how hard it was to see the parents crying as the dad was on the floor, you know, screaming out, you know, about, about his baby and, and, you know, expressing his grief outward. And she says that she was very, very worried about um, seeing them again at the hospital because, like I told you, baby A was a twin. Um, I actually think I said um, one of two brothers. Baby A was a boy. Baby B is his twin sister. So, so I misspoke earlier. I apologize. Um, there's so many. And that's, it, it's awful. There's that many that it's going to get very confusing. Um, but the parents would still be at the hospital because baby B is still in the hospital. She is still there, also in the neonatal unit because she too, of course, was born at 31 weeks. And, you know, same family. Lucy hasn't done enough, right? So, now she is in charge of taking care of baby B. So after all that, here she is. And baby B, who had been doing just fine, just fine, around midnight on June the 9th, baby B crashes. So, about 28 hours after baby A has died, baby B starts crashing. Her blood oxygen drops. Her oxygen lines that were have been supplying her with oxygen were no longer connected to her. I'm certain she did not disconnect them herself. Um, because they, And they were, like, through her nose. Not connected anymore. Um, you know, her alarms start going off. She's blue. She's not breathing. You know, doctors, they... They go in and they they are able, thankfully, to resuscitate her. But much like with baby A's medical situation happened, Lucy starts Facebook stalking the mom again after baby B has her incident. So, you know, what are you doing? Why are you looking up to mom each and every time? Are you just trying to see what type of response that you're initiating out of her? Because that's sick is what that is. That's just flat out sick. Um... You know, baby B would make a recovery, and, and, and during testimony, it was it was uh, told that she did not suffer long-term effects from this, but they do believe that she had the same type of air injection as her brother. So, you know, I mean, this poor family, she was going to try and attempt to take both of their children. She took one. She wasn't successful with the other one, but, like, I mean, monster much, you know? Um... So anyway, Lucy starts texting her colleagues on June the 11th, which is just a couple days after the, these two incidents. And she starts saying, you know, t t talking that, to the NICU manager and, and her other work peers that she actually wants to pick up more shifts because that's the only way to get over this, right? The only way to, I believe she said, you know, not have their face like constantly in your mind was to just throw yourself back into the war in your work, right? 
like the freaking nerve y'all the freaking nerve like two days later she's wanting to go back because it's like i mean she's ready to go back to the playground right she wants to go back try it all over again so you know here we here here now we meet sweet little baby c so we're on to our third one baby c was born 10 weeks premature only weighing one pound and 12 ounces um but was stable you know he he was stable he was doing okay um and then on june 14th enter nurse ratchet again and she was actually assigned to a different baby in a different room who was in critical need of care as well but when baby c's nurse left the room for just a few minutes you know i don't know if she was taking a break or going to do paperwork or whatever but she leaves his his side for just a few seconds and he crashes out of just nowhere so like she rushes back because she hears all this commotion going on you know this is her baby that she's taking care of and she finds lucy right beside his little cot and like what do you what do you think she's doing she's not doing nothing because why would she she caused this she's not doing a thing so you know only one in the room baby's crashed so he recovers but he crashes again within about 15 minutes and again, she's the only one close to his little cot right then. And this time, he wouldn't make it. Baby C didn't survive. He died June the 14th. And it is suspected that Lucy injected air into his stomach via that nasal tube. It, and that, it, it causes breathing issues, but then it also ultimately leads to the baby going into cardiac arrest. So, I mean... what kind of person is this chick right a nurse would later testify that you know baby c's parents they're they're saying their goodbyes and they are you know in in a in a really really bad way and the nurse said that she basically almost had to like force lucy out of the room because i guess she's just wanting to be there to watch the grief happen like i don't know if this is like some sick power thing for her that she was manipulating the fact that they were one minute elated because their baby's getting better and then the next minute they're down because they're, they're grief stricken because she's she's taken his life or if it's just she just likes to watch people in pain i, I don't know but uh, it, and, and like poor baby c i guess his heart restarted and he started breathing again um you know doctor said you know he'd obviously been without nutrition he'd been without oxygen so they they're not even sure i don't think why the heart was starting and stopping other than the fact of what she had done to him um you know i guess and the life-saving measures his little body was was trying to fight um but it's just heartbreaking right like the fact that just you know they're having to to hold him through all this and and, and I don't want to say drag it out. That sounds terrible, but that that's almost what's happening because the inevitable is going to happen. And then here they are experiencing that at her hand. Right. Um, so she, she also took over preparing the memory box. Another that I guess the head, the nurse that was on over his case was going to prepare this. They do things like a lock of hair and just a few other keepsakes, um, you know, for the parents to, to cherish what little, little that they had. Um, she kind of just kept going into the family room like she was just making her presence extremely known but extremely awkward it was very inappropriate um and the father would later testify that like you know, after all that's going on like you know she's trying to just be in the room and be completely you know involved when she shouldn't be she should be letting the families do what they need to do to be okay she bursts into the room with a ventilated basket and she's like well you've said your goodbyes you want me to put them in here and his wife had to look at her and say he's he's not even dead yet you go like y'all y'all this this lady I, just, I got nothing. I got nothing. I'm, I'm getting, I'm upset and I'm mad and I, I just, I don't know. I mean, the Undertaker sweatshirt is appropriate because I just want to choke slam her right now. Um, and again, she would do her same ritual where she started searching the family on Facebook. Um, you know, the timing of, of this Facebook search actually coincided with when she probably would have been waking up after her shift. You know, she ended it, went home, went to bed, woke up. And the first thing she did was like start looking up this family. So 
I just, I find that odd. Um, apparently the manager over the nursing unit wanted her to take a break after the, the death of um, baby A, and she was a bit angry about that. Uh, she didn't believe that she needed to take any type of break. Um, and these texts kind of continued on after the death of baby C as well. So we, you know, we see that they're trying to tell her to take some time off and she's, she's saying, no, I want to throw myself back into my work. When in reality it was like, I mean, yeah, she did. She wanted to throw herself back into her work, but not the work that we're thinking that you would be thinking of. She's just wanting to get back to I, whatever this mess is that she, she's doing here. Um, so then we meet baby D. So baby D is a baby girl who was born premature, um, or, or not premature, I'm sorry, she wasn't born premature, she wasn't deemed a NICU baby, but she was mistakenly put into the NICU after um, the hospital routed her incorrectly uh, after a suspected infection at birth, if I'm understanding that correctly. Um, but she was, she was doing just fine. She's getting along. She's, you know, getting stronger every day. She's doing well. She shouldn't have even been there in the NICU. And then all of a sudden, she just takes a turn for the worse like healthy baby crashes three times like during the night I believe of June 21st and it one of these collapses I think it was the second one they describe her as just being inconsolable crying and just visibly distressed and then by the third collapse they can't revive her and then lo and behold she's got that same skin discoloration as baby A did so, you know, here she, she is, this normal, healthy baby. She, she's crashing over and over. She's visibly distressed. She can't be comforted in any way. She's crying inconsolably. And then she passes away on June 22nd without explanation. So during the trial, the medical team testified that it is their belief that she too had been injected with air into her bloodstream. So... Here we go. And then yet again, what do you think picks up immediately after she passes? Lucy's Facebook searching, looking up the, the parents of baby D. And then uh, the, the texting again, like she's texting all these um, colleagues about how this just had to be fate and all this type of stuff. And it's like, it's not fate, Nurse Ratchet. Nurse Ratchet. It's you. It's psycho. It's not fate. It's psycho. It's it's being psychotic. Is what is what's happening here? But I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Maybe maybe it's just me that thinks that. But uh, I doubt it. So, so now that brings us to baby E. So baby E um, was born in July, and by July. I believe it was around July the 2nd, there were some reviews that had gone on because, you know, there were several deaths that had happened in a row. Um, it was noted that Lucy was the only nurse on duty, um, but nobody ever really questioned her. They, they, you know, they're making connections that these deaths are happening and they're happening back to back to back. She was a nurse on duty, but no one asked her any questions about it. I don't know why. Don't know why. I, there was a lot of missteps in this case, with this hospital, and you'll see that. I don't want to be too terribly critical of the hospital, but, the, I mean, here we are. So, you know, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, something's wrong here, right? Um, but because nobody, nobody suspected her, nobody's questioning her, nobody's putting her on paid, paid leave if you don't think she did anything, but you think you might need to still take a look at something, um, we meet, we meet baby, we meet baby E and, and she meets baby E because she just keeps on reporting to duty and baby E is a twin brother, um, a twin boy and the mom of baby E was actually described as going to the neonatal unit to visit baby E and finding him visibly distressed and he's bleeding from his mouth. So... That that's a red flag right there for me as a mom. Like I'm freaking out. I'm ripping an incubator open or something. But Nurse Lucy calms her down and tells her that he is okay. He is okay, and you can leave and be comforted because I know he's okay. Because why? Because you can trust me. Because I'm a nurse. Girl. 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 Later on that night, 
baby E went into a, a very desperate medical situation and lost so much blood that a doctor actually described it as the most blood loss he has ever seen out of an infant and would sadly pass away um, from, from this blood loss. And the mom actually believes now that she walked in on Lucy attacking baby E and what, what was believed to be her injecting air into his bloodstream as well. Um, and that she interrupted her while she was doing it. And, and while it wasn't preventable, I guess she, you know, maybe she prolonged it a little bit, but, but that was, that was, uh, the mom's belief. And, and I don't think she's wrong there. And it's also been noted in the trial that Lucy had faked, a lot of nursing notes. Um, she would create false hand sheets and things like that to kind of cover her tracks and cover what was going on so that people weren't, you know, I guess being suspicious necessarily of, of these weird collapses when a baby was improving. And once again, she also, after baby E passes away, she picks up those Google searches again or, or Facebook social media searches. I mean, and this carried on to even looking up these families um, from the end of July, early August, all the way to Christmas Day. So, like, girl. Like, she, strange, strange duck here. Um, baby E, as I said, was a twin. Uh, baby E's twin brother was Baby F. Baby F got very, very sick the day after Baby E's death. Baby E died on the 4th of August. Baby F becomes very sick on the 5th of August. Of course, guess who's assigned to him? nurse Lucy and you know this would be where we we saw we see a different method to the murder I don't know if she just got bored or she thought she'd try something new to, to so no one be on our tail I have no idea um but baby baby F was on a specific type of nutrition bag so he was getting his primary means of nutrition through this bag um being administered to him daily and Lucy is believed to have injected insulin into this bag. Now, that his blood sugar levels had had drastically changed. His heart rate was elevated. Um, the blood uh, a blood sample confirmed that insulin levels were extremely high. And while Lucy, I guess you know, might you know could have said this was a mistake. Um, you know, bag got mixed up or something was inadvertently administered to him. No other baby in the NICU was prescribed any type of insulin. So this was intentional, very, very intentional. It was not an accident. Um, and they do believe that she injected it into his bag, into his nutrition bag. So this poor little guy is laying here getting his nutrition from a bag. He's not even able to be, you know, fed by his mother. He's not be able to, to, to do anything on his own right now. And you, nurse from hell, go and inject insulin into this little guy's bag. I mean, to do what? Like, I mean, you're a nurse, so I guess you know what could happen. But, I mean, are you just trying to see? Are you just trying to carry out, like, a science experiment and just see what happens? Like, oh, my God. Like, I don't even know. Um, so, you know, baby F collapses. She starts texting her colleagues about how, you know, the parents, you know, as they're saying their goodbyes, they actually look at her and they thank her for taking such good care of them. They, they thank her for that. So, I mean, it, like, that doesn't bother her. Clearly, it doesn't bother her because she's texting and she's telling and she's reliving. Like, I feel like, you know, a lot of serial killers, they, they will send text messages or do phone calls or not just serial killers, anybody that commits a crime. They're trying to set up an alibi, right? Like, they're trying to establish timeline. They're trying to do all these things as we've seen in other cases. But I think this, I think this hoe is just reliving it. She's reliving it every single time through these messages, and she's loving it. She's loving the sympathy she's getting from her coworkers. She's loving telling the story about the grieving parents, and she's loving the parents probably, like, fawning all over her, as I probably would a nurse who took care of me and my sick child. You know, I, I had a child that was in the PICU for a while, and those nurses were freaking angels, man. They took such good care of us. I never was worried one second that one of them was doing anything sinister. Never. So I feel like the comfort level of these parents was there too because they, they didn't know it shouldn't be, right? She pulled the wool over everyone's eyes. Like, I just, mm -mm. no, ma'am. No, ma'am. 
So fast, so fast forward slightly um, to September, and we meet Baby G. Baby G was born premature, um, weighing only a pound and two ounces. It's just itty bitty, teeny tiny little sweet pea. She was actually born in a different hospital, but as she made some progress, they moved her to Countess of Chester. Countess of Chester. That's, that's a time twister, man. Um, but baby G was doing well. She was actually, she hit her 100th day in the NICU. And I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a NICU parent by any means, but I do have friends who are And those days and those big milestones like that are important. And not because, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard. I can't imagine what it's like to have your baby in the hospital for over three months, but because, you know, they're thriving and they've made it to that hundredth day, you know, and going home is on the horizon, hopefully. And, you know, the nurses are all excited. They decorate the nursery when she's there and they make a cake and like everybody's just so, so excited. And the stinking day of that celebration, Lucy takes, she takes shift and she takes action. And she overfeeds this little girl to the point that this baby is like, just she's violently vomiting and then stops breathing because of it. I mean, like doctors freak out. They're like, oh my God, she's regressing. Like what, you know, we thought she was doing so well. What was going on? She recovers from this, this instance. But they actually send her back to the other hospital for some specialized care, which, what happens? She recovers. Imagine that. Imagine when she's away from the devil and herself, like, she recovers. So, great. Then they send her back to the Countess of Chester, because while she's recovered, she still needs to be in intensive care. So, on September 21st, she's back under Lucy's care again. And what happens? She it, it, she's hooked up to all this machinery and things like that, but <sighs> Lucy, she just she starts having the same symptoms again. And while these alarms and these bells and these whistles, they set thing they set um, you know the alarms off and set the doctors into into motion to re, to to revive and to help her and protect her life. Um, sadly, it doesn't help poor baby G completely because she's left severely disabled from these collapses that were caused when she returned to the hospital. And what happens again? The Facebook searches for baby G's family. So I don't, I don't even know why I'm mentioning it at this point because you know, it's just a recurring theme, but there we are. She's searching them on Facebook again. And by this point, you know, the hospital staff, they're starting to talk. Because if you know anything, you know your coworkers are going to be the first ones that notice something weird is going on with you. And they, they're starting to talk. And they're like, hey, you know, what's going on? Um, this is starting to look a little weird. Lucy's always around. These babies are collapsing. And we have, I mean, it's like every stinking baby coming through here now it feels like it's collapsing. And here she always is. Like, she's like the freaking angel of death or something. What's going on? Um you know, and then, you know, Lucy complains to her manager even about, you know, people are talking about her and all this kind of stuff. It's like, well, no crap they are, but okay. Um, so, people are getting suspicious, but not suspicious enough, I guess, because she keeps on going. And by September 26th, we meet baby H. Um, so, so thankfully, baby H is not one that you're going to hear us refer to a whole lot because baby H did survive. Although, um, when baby H was in the NICU and the father of baby H left the infant alone for just a few minutes, he came back and found the chest drain that the baby had in the room, uh, had in the room, Jesus, had in its little body had been removed. And... I don't know a lot about chest drains and things like that, but this was a critical piece of medical equipment that this infant needed to, th to thrive and survive, and it was taken out. Yet again, I doubt a NICU infant is sitting up and saying, I don't want this no more, and taking it out. So, who do we think is responsible in this situation? And still, we're, we're still letting her report back into work. So, she meets yet again another baby, baby I in October of 2015. I mean, we're not even, we're not even through 2015 yet. We're already up to I. This is crazy. So, so poor little baby I. Baby I is a victim of Lucy's. Not one, not two, not three, but y'all four times she attacked this kid 
four times before she took took their little life. So she was injecting air into baby I's stomach through a tube. And, you know, she kept saying that, you know, the baby was pale and, and, and all this type of stuff too. Like a, if a nurse would walk by, but she wouldn't do anything. You know, if you walk in and you see a baby's pale or, you know, not responsive or limp or whatever as a nurse, even not as a nurse, I'm not a nurse. I, I don't want to be a nurse because I would be a terrible nurse. I'd panic all the time, but you would call someone, right? Or you would try to do something. If you're trained, you'd try to do something. No, nah, not her. She's just like, no, oh, well, I'm just going to stand over here. Wait this one out. You know, see see if what I did works this time. Um, and poor little baby I, I mean, baby I made, made several, several recoveries before she finally crashed for the final time on, on October 12th. And what's the common thing again lucy's sitting there standing right beside the incubator when all the alarms start going off and the nurses rush in and this baby is screaming inconsolably screaming and lucy's not doing a dang thing not doing anything to help and they there was testimony given and this this fast forward about 30 seconds if you don't want to hear this um there was testimony given that this baby was in excruciating pain and that was why the baby was screaming. Now, I don't know if a medical professional can <laughs> can tell you what type of pain uh, an infant experiences. I have no idea. But I would think as a mother who has been around infants, that if they are screaming like that inconsolably after watching my child have colic, um, you know, the air infections, things like that, and they're screaming when they're in pain, you know that scream. And I would venture to say that these doctors knew that scream too. So here poor little baby I is just just howling, howling. And she's not doing anything because she's already done what she set out to do. She's already done it. She injected that air in that bloodstream and that baby suffered and that baby passed away. So mm -mm. I just want to fight her. I want to fight her so bad. Um, so finally... In October, took took until October 26th before, you know, a, 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 not before a doctor would get concerned because the doctor's been concerned. They, they've raised some red flags. They've tried to talk to people, and it hasn't really gone very far. But after baby I's death, a staff review, you know, again shows that Lucy has been by these children's side during the collapses. And, you know, the doctor is very concerned a consultant who has been brought in to analyze these reviews, um, you know, kind of calls a concern to management, but is told, you know, basically not to make a fuss, not to make a fuss. And I mean, like, you know, I ain't a hospital consultant or nothing like that, but I think a fuss has done been made, y'all. Like a fuss has been made. You've got, we're up to I, we're up to letter I. A fuss is made. We're, we're beyond fussing and cussing and carrying on. Like this is serious, but... What do I know, right? What do I know? So in the middle of all this, poor little baby Jay shows up into the picture and into the NICU. Now, baby Jay had been born prematurely in November of 2015. And baby Jay had an issue with her bowels. Um, and there was some, had to have some surgery performed. And she now had two stomas. So if you're not familiar with what that is, it's actually where your part of your bowels um, are usually emptying on the outside of your body. A uh, lot of times they'll put on like a colostomy bag or things like that to you know to catch the waste. But it's a lot. It it gives the the bowels time to heal after a major surgery like that before they can go in and maybe do a repair. So she's she's got all this type of stuff going on, but she's doing well with it, and she's now come to the Countess of Chester Hospital to recover from her surgeries, and, and she's doing well enough to be out of the specialized hospital is how I took it. It sounds very much like over here they have the specialty hospitals that deal with these type of things, and then as the babies move to needing just more of an intensive care watch, then they go to the like the Countess of Chester type hospital. So here comes baby Jay. So she's trying to recover in the NICU. Um... Her parents start to have a few complaints because they don't think she's being properly cared for. I think I saw where someone testified on their behalf that they had seen um, her wrapped in like a blanket. Um, they had 
you know, fecal matter on it and things like that. But, um, you know, not saying that was correct because uh, I wasn't there, but I will say she definitely wasn't being taken care of correctly because out of nowhere, she suddenly collapses. Just She's doing fine one day and then boom, she collapses. And a medical expert would honestly believe that she had, there, there had been an attempt to smother her. So, you know, doing just fine. And then now all of a sudden somebody's trying to smother our baby out. Like, I mean, what the heck? And, and she did recover. Baby J did recover. And to my knowledge, as of, as of filming this, I could not find where they had said anything about where the collapse had been determined what the cause was other than the belief was smothering. But of course, then if they believe Lucy did it, but not necessarily being able to completely tie her to that. And we'll kind of get into that more towards the end. Um, you know, but by this point, you know, February 2016, there there's a review ordered by a doctor. Um, all these deaths, Lucy's, you know, presence at the deaths. It's been, it's too much. Like they, they're, they're aware that there has to be some linkage here. And so they decided to call a meeting, but this meeting wasn't going to take place for three to four months um, after this review. And they did not have anything again done to Lucy. They didn't put her on leave. They didn't tell her she needed to go, you know, do something else, whatever. She's still showing up to work and she's still managing to find her way into the NICU. Um, I do think they had swapped some shifts around. You know, they put her on day shift versus night shift and they could see some linkages there, but you're still letting her show up. Like, you think this lady is like up and killing babies and you're still letting her show up. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. And we would see several other babies fall under her care. Um, one being baby K. Baby K had been born 12 weeks early, um, and a doctor would testify that when this baby was 98 minutes old, he found Lucy standing in front of her incubator, and this baby was not breathing. Her breathing tube appeared to have been dislodged, and the alarms on her, on her monitors had been silenced. And Lucy is standing there, not doing anything yet again, just standing there, just, just hanging out just hanging out like nothing's wrong so you know no one was alerted right away help did eventually come once this doctor found you know saw the situation but you know sadly three days later baby k would pass away as well and you know lucy was not charged with the murder of baby k but she has been charged with the attempted murder so um Again, they believe that she has something to do with it, but I think it has become very hard for them to tie her to the actual deaths of some of these just because of the timing and, of course, the not seeing exactly what happened. Um, but, you know, she didn't give up easily. So, introduce baby L and baby M. So, baby L and baby M, are, they are twins. And baby L was a an attack of of lucy similar to baby f's where she administered administered the insulin however this time she upped the dosage because i guess she saw that with baby f it didn't quite work uh she must not give him enough so she's like i'm gonna up the ante here and she did and she she blasted that poor child with insulin in, in his um nutrition bag as well and baby m is attacked shortly after baby l's crash and that was with air into, injected into his bloodstream. And sadly, you know, he, he's crashing. His heart rate is, is through the roof. Or, or crashing, I'm sorry, through the floor, not through the roof. Um, he did improve and he did survive. But it shouldn't have had to get to here, you know? I mean, this poor doctor, he's still lodging his complaints. They're falling on deaf ears. The executives are just like, ah, it's got to be a coincidence that she's always on duty. It's got to be a coincidence that we've had, like, up teen number of babies die, and this lady's standing right here beside them, and, you know, but, I mean, and they were seemingly doing well, and then all of a sudden she walks into the room and they collapse. I mean, I don't, I don't know what more of a coincidence you could want, right? Like, what the... Anyway, anyway, so that brings us to baby N, to baby N, and baby N would unfortunately encounter Lucy, 
and it weighing just around three and a, just under three and a half pounds. Um, baby M was in good condition, um, but he did have a blood disorder. Nothing that I don't think was believed that he couldn't overcome, but again, blood disorder landed him in the NICU with Lucy. And out of nowhere, what do you think happened? Baby in collapsed, blood oxygen levels drop, heart rate drops, he's crying and he's screaming, um, you know, just inconsolably. And again, medical experts believe that he had air injected into his bloodstream. Uh, baby N did recover, but still, I mean, this, thank God, I, I, these babies, hopefully the ones that recovered and, and were not disabled from this will recover normally and not remember this because, I mean, can you imagine thinking and knowing that your baby nurse tried to murder you? Like, what is going on? Um, so shortly after this, uh, now we're in June of 2016 and we will meet babies O, P, and Q. Now, they are triplets, and baby O was said to have been stable um, until the afternoon of June the 16th, or, or the, an afternoon in June of 2016, and baby O all of a sudden just deteriorated. I don't know where collapsed, deteriorated, and passed away. Like, what in the world? So... That an autopsy would show that baby O had a liver injury and some unclotted blood in his system at the time that he passed away. And the uh, pathologist that was brought on to, to testify in the trial believes that this was caused by some sort of like impact trauma um, to him and that he also had an uh, excess, a reason to believe that he had excess air in his system. So, I don't know what she did to this poor little guy besides just the air, but liver injury on top of that. Like, I don't, I don't know if she like, kicked him on the way out or what. I mean, when, nothing would surprise me with this with this lady from at this point. Um, baby P, so another member of the triplet trio. Baby P has started deteriorating right before he was supposed to be moved. They were going to move him to a different hospital for treatment. And Lucy was was coined as saying, well, he's not leaving the hospital alive, is he? Well, I guess not if you have anything to do with it now, is he? Um, but so right after she said that, right after all this stuff, baby P, baby P collapses, baby P passes away. Like baby O, P, and Q's parents have to be basket cases by now because this is now, you know, second baby that they've lost out of three they just delivered. Um, and experts would also say that it looks to be that he had air injected into his stomach, causing him issues when breathing as well, much like his brother. And then uh, what happens to the third triplet, you might ask? Well, baby Q, Lucy couldn't leave him alone either because, you know, after murdering his brothers, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander, I guess. So, you know, she decides, though, to do this one differently because, you know, I guess, I don't know, she's getting bored. I don't know what she's doing, but she doesn't want to just do the air in the, in the system. She actually, th this is horrific. She pours what we believe to be a clear liquid down the baby's throat, either water or saline, via the baby's uh, nasogastric nasogastric tube i think i'm saying that right the tube through the nose that goes into the stomach she pours so much clear liquid down this poor baby that he begins vomiting just violently and clear liquid about 9 a.m on june 25th so um you know he's he's just just violently ill and with a clear liquid, which has the doctors perplexed. Like, they're coming up with all these reasons why this poor baby could be throwing up like this. Like, could something be wrong with his bowels? Could he be? Could he have a bacterial infection? Like, what is going on? And his blood oxygen's dropping. His heart rate's going down. Like, you know, what in the world? They're able to revive him. But, you know, what in the world could have caused Baby Q to go through all this? Well, I guess Lucy is 
hearing the the rumblings and and all that so she starts texting another staff member and it, or in a doctor and is you know questioning you know what could have caused it and then commenting on how she must not be good enough because all these babies are going down on her watch and you know worrying about what people are thinking of her and you know like the <laughs> the, the doctor like this this chucklehead is going on and saying that like he would give her like you know basically like a statement saying what a great person she is if it ever came down to her being questioned and all this type of stuff and it's like bro she got the bull pulled over your eyes i don't know what she's doing behind the scenes with you but wake up and smell the folders dude like like i mean dang like you think people ain't growing suspicious by now like come on so so thankfully we stop with baby Hugh. At least that's all we know about, all I read about as of now. I don't think I want to read anymore. If we're getting all the way to Z, I don't even want to know. But during the testimony, you know, lots of parents would, they would give a uh, testimony about how Lucy just made them flat out feel uncomfortable. The way she would hover after the deaths or in these very hard situations. Um, and then she'd say like weird stuff like, Oh, I remember when I held him or I gave him his first bath. And then she would smile like this, just smile at him. Like, this is not a happy time right now. I mean, I, I understand that, you know, celebrations of life and whatnot. But when your baby has just passed away, that is not the time. Not the time, not the time, not the time. So... I, I'm picturing that movie smile like in my head. I can't help it. I can't help it. I guess shot I see her just being so scary and evil. Um, but um, she and she she would write the I can't even speak. Like this is what she does to me. She even wrote the family sympathy cards. And like on the surface, like I would be okay with that because you know I think it could be touching maybe for a nurse to connect with a family and tell them how sorry she she is. And you know I mean she was there. For the event that kind of thing but knowing what she did and she's sending them a sympathy card like girl you a special kind of evil and you a special kind of hateful like i mean i don't know your cornbread ain't done in the middle and it shows because you are crazy crazy um, so finally this doctor that's been suspicious of this the whole time finally somebody like, like starts to, I guess, kind of listen. I don't know. They don't remove her right away. It takes some time, but finally, you know, I think she is kind of removed from the situation. I don't think she's actually let go off of her job or anything like that, but, or sent home, but she is at least pulled off the situation and they actually started an investigation. And as best I could read, um, as to why this may have taken so long is it sounds like it was a little touch of a cover up. And I, I, I'm saying that lightly. I'm not being accusatory of anybody over anything, but it does sound like there was a lot of hospital funding that w could have been affected if, you know, we're having this problem, like a serial killer nurse on our hands. So maybe they didn't want to see the problem. You know, if we don't see it we don't talk about it we don't know about it. you know it's not there right like we just don't talk about it. it's not happening and, and yet it's still very much happening i mean she was literally allowed to just be in this full-up playground of hers to carry out all these acts and nobody was doing a dang thing about it like you know people are trying to tell you that something's going wrong and you're like oh, yes, yes, let's look over here not over here like we don't want to talk about that right now we need some money or something so I hope I, I hope that's not accurate. I hope people weren't just covering up something just for money, but people have done a whole lot, a whole lot more for the Almighty Dollar than just to just turn in a blind eye. So who knows? But anyway, finally, 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 she is arrested. She is arrested, like I said, three different times, and finally in November of 2020, it's stuck. We are charged. She's formally charged. Thank the Lord. Like we get, we're getting her out of this this situation to, to affect any more families. And of course her defense, you know, attorneys, they do what they do and they, they come forward and say, you know, she's a victim of circumstance, coincidence. She's just like literally the most unfortunate, unlucky person in the world to be at the wrong place, wrong time, every single time. And then they blame the system. They blame the hospital system for failing her. They say, you know, that they were understaffed and, and all this type of stuff. And I'm sure they were. Cause I mean, what hospital isn't, but 
coincidentally, the number of infant death rates has now gone back to the statistical average and on par with the rest of the hospitals around the UK now that Nurse Ratchet has been put, on, put in jail. Coincidence? Coincidence? That's a coincidence. That's, that's, the, no, no. That is circumstantial, factual, metric-driven facts. Truth right there can be tied to her. I'm, you know, I don't know. So they searched her house. Um, they found some, some different stuff there. Lots of, of handwritten post-it notes, illegible notes, uh, diary entries, things like that, with words like help me and, and um, evil and things like that, like circled and, and bolded and, you know, phrases like killing me softly. And um, I can't remember, like, I can't do this anymore. Um, no one will ever know what happened or why and all this stuff. I mean, you know, like, it just sounds like normal doodles, right? Like, if you're, if you're on Spotify and you can't see this, I am making the most sarcastic face I've ever made. So, um, and, and like, I think she was a little strange. I mean, they would find like birthday cards and stuff from what I read and Christmas cards and they were written to, she wrote them to herself, like from her cats. And, and don't get me wrong. I got two, I got three cats. And I love my cats. And I would get another cat. And I have my dog. You see her every video. I love my dog. But I'm not writing myself love notes from any of my pets. I mean, if they want to leave a love note, then then they they are welcome to do so. Um, but they can't write, so we usually don't go there. But, yeah. So she's a little different. But, I mean, you know, you, you can be a little different if you want to do that. I mean, people throw birthday parties for their pets and stuff. Like, I mean, it's fine. But when you couple it with all of, of the evil and I'm and this and help me and all these things, and then you find out that she has been storing some of the nursing notes with the baby's names on them in her house and in her parents' house, feeling a little trophy-ish, serial killer-ish, trophy-ish to me. Um, but again, I, I know nothing. I am a lady on the internet with a camera, a mic, and entirely too much to talk about. So maybe I'm wrong. But it sounds, sounds weird to me. Sounds serial killer-esque to me. Sounds like a baby killer to me. Um, but either way, um, she claims, you know, she just wanted to work with kids. All these accusations are awful. Um, you know, just da-da-da-da-da. The reporters, they would go on to say, you know, she was super composed during her trial. Except for when she would talk about herself, she would cry. She would get emotional then, and she would get a cr and she would get to crying when they would discuss a specific doctor that she apparently had a crush on. I think he was married. Um, she would get emotional about that, but not about these little babies, y'all. Like when they're talking about like the baby being in pain and screaming and all these deaths and all these parents and all this type of stuff, she ain't showing. She ain't feeling no kind of way. You know, I, I mean, she's just, she's fine. And then she starts talking about this guy that she thinks is like doctor of the month, hunk of the month or something. And she gets all emotional and then she cries when she talks about herself. And I cannot imagine, cannot imagine how these jurors are absorbing this. Like they're, they're, first of all, they've had to hear all this for 10 months. All you've heard about is dying babies. I cannot imagine your mental state at that point. And then when you see her butt take the stand, and then you're like, she only crying when she's talking about herself. Or Dr. Joe, it's not, I, it, they didn't give his name, so hopefully that's not his real name. But, like, I mean, like, bless their hearts. Like, I don't know how they're even close to normal after this. They, they, they may not be. They probably need counseling and therapy after listening to this because I can't imagine that doesn't change you as a person. And then witnessing the pure evil in front of you. It took them 76 hours to deliberate and they found her guilty. They found her guilty of murder of seven of the babies and then attempted murder of seven more. Um, the judge, you know, was spoke at her sentencing and he gave her the whole life sentences on each offense, which means without the possibility of parole. Um, she did not choose to attend her sentencing. It's my understanding that she could hear it via video call, but she refused to be there in person. I guess that is a thing that they can do in the UK. Um, but needless to say, it was still a doozy, right? Like a whole life, um, whole life sentence. So well-deserved 
Lucy. Well deserved. Um, but yeah, um, she is going to be up for a retrial, I believe, on Baby K. So Baby K, she was only charged with the attempted murder. So they're going to go back on a retrial with that because she was not... I won't say she wasn't found not guilty of some of the attempted murders, but some were not able to be proven. So I think they are going to be able to retry those. Um, and that is set, I believe, for June of 2024. So we've got a little while before we'll see that one come back around. Um, they're expecting it to last up to about three weeks. But, you know, who knows? I don't think anybody ever expected this trial to go on for 10 months. But, yeah. So that's Lucy, y'all. That is Lucy let me um mm -mm. i mean the world is divided on this on lucy's innocence just just the facts that the prosecution presented i think they got it right um i i can always have my opinion changed though um so any you know I, i'm still going to be following this very intently um she pulled the wool over so many people's eyes and to look at her i would never look at her and be like oh it's a serial killer because she just looks like this just you know girl next door type look that you know like you would just trust right she has the face of what you would think you know uh, a sweet NICU nurse would have like she just has had this kind fun fun loving look to her and below the surface was something sinister so yeah, I mean, if you have a differing opinion, if you've, if you've read into more than I have, if you've seen something I haven't seen, by all means, you know, please feel free to, to, to leave it in the comments. I always encourage you to do your own research because I am definitely prone to mistakes, definitely, you know, have my own opinions, um, but opinions are just that, and they can easily be changed, so who knows, um, but as of right now, y'all, yeah, I just, I think they got it right on this one, so, um, that's it for me. That was heavy, heavy. Um, but it was one that was requested, actually, so I'm glad we talked about it. And I do hope that, um, you know, this is the last, hopefully, we hear about Nurse Lucy outside of the retrial. Because I just think we need to pack that one away and, and uh, just keep those babies and their families in our thoughts and prayers and keep their legacy alive. But let hers just be put on the shelf for a while while she serves her time so anyway that's gonna do it for me like i said this was a long one thank you guys for hanging with me please don't forget to like comment subscribe share and rate the podcast if you're ever on spotify um if you're on youtube i am on spotify as well uh please go find me on instagram as well or tiktok at misty sims brd and if you have a case that you would like me to cover please email me at cases for misty at gmail.com so until next time my friends i want you to stay sweet and stay safe out there and i will see you in the next one bye